Awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, for having us. And thank you to those folks that are joining live and, uh, and anyone that, that's, uh, that's watching uh, after this gets re recorded. So um, I'm excited to talk about this technology. This is stuff that we work on here at solo.io and with our customers all around the world. Um, first, let's, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm Christian Post. I've, I've been here at Solo, uh, Solo for um, actually close, coming close to, to four years. Uh, been working on Istio since the very beginning of, uh, of that community. And, uh, and here at Solo, we've, we've been working on eBPF and Cilium for, uh, for quite a while now too. I uh, just recently published a book with my co-author Renor back in March on, on Istio. It's a, it's a real deep treatment of, of Istio and uh, a lot of the a lot of the lessons that we've learned over the last, it took us about three and a half years to, to write the book. So um, uh, check that out. And uh, the, the last bit is that what, what we do here at Solo and, and why I'm excited to talk about this technology and, and work on these types of problems is around application networking. So you can think of that as what is a modern take of, uh, of managing APIs and service connectivity in a cloud world uh, that's, that's quite a bit different than, than what we saw 10, 15 years ago. And what are some of the technologies that, uh, especially open source technologies that can help us solve those problems uh, in, in, in a way that better fits the, our, our GitOps and DevOps type workflows. Um, things like Istio and Cilium and Envoy, those, those form the foundation of uh, of, of what we see as uh, some of the right solutions and, and that you'll see you know, in any of our products that, uh, that we go to market with and work with our customers on. So happy to chat that uh, about any of that stuff offline as well. Uh, but really what we're gonna talk about today is how things like Kubernetes, things like in our, our modern uh, application architectures, microservices and so on, how they require a different way to um, solve problems around connectivity. So in May, back at KubeCon EU, we announced that we're bringing Cilium, which is a very exciting open source uh, Linux and container networking uh, project into our, our solution that, um, that helps facilitate defense in depth and networking in layers and, and, and solving these problems uh, accordingly. Now, what the problem is specifically is how do services, applications, clients talk to other services, APIs, uh, whether inside a deployment in an organization or outside, so crossing boundaries. And a lot in, in the past, you know, doesn't really hold up. So how we solve these problems in the, in the past doesn't, doesn't translate very well to these cloud environments that are very dynamic, changing quickly, right? That's the whole point of microservices to be able to change code quickly and independently and move very fast. Things like security, things like resilience, things like observability and how you're tracking applications and understanding what an application is. You know, these things, you know, the, the, the way we've done them in the past doesn't, doesn't hold up as, uh, as well. And so we talk about application network, we talk about solving these connectivity problems, some light, you know, API management style type problems as well, and doing that in a way that can be applied independent of where the application is deployed, independently of how the application was written or what language it was used, uh, maybe pulling some of the stuff out of the application even and, and being able to change it through policy, being able to change it dynamically and quickly to keep up with the way our applications are changing. Throw in the fact that you know, most organizations are looking at a multi data center, multi cloud, multi home solution for how they build their, their applications and their services. And they may have existing data centers. They might have existing VM deployments or physical server deployments. They're exploring Docker, they're exploring Kubernetes, or maybe they're 
fairly advanced and they've adopted these technologies. Maybe they've adopted them in a private cloud or in a public cloud on-prem. And now they, they, they need the consistency of their security policies, the resilience policies, the behavior of these applications. Can't just try to figure this out when things go wrong, right? We need some level of consistency and understandability of, uh, of the system. And you know how these things connect is extremely important to that. Additionally, the way we look at security and um, you know traffic control, uh, API management, these types of things have changed as well. In the past, what we did was just force everything through some centralized system, whether it's internal traffic or external traffic. Just force it, stand up a lot of load balancers to represent these applications, and hopefully that'll be dynamic enough. Um, but we've, we've found that it's not. And these centralized systems tend to uh, cause all kinds of bottlenecks. Um, you know, the, the, the technology wasn't built for this, these highly distributed environments and, and constantly changing environments. Additionally, a lot of those, uh, those same uh, um, problems crop up when you think about security and how trust is, is established on the network. You know, when containers and applications are coming up and coming down and changing and scaling, auto scaling and so on, failing all the time, you know, how you write networking rules and how you secure and identify what a service is, those, that, that, that's a very hard problem to solve now in, in, in this world. So a lot of these solutions have become outdated, um, new technology, some of it, maybe a majority of it really um, kind of coming from and, uh, and uh, originating from the, some of the large cloud providers that, uh, that, that have gone through these problems already, um, you know, the, the, and, and have become open source. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, good technology that, uh, that is built specifically for solving the, these types of problems. So let's, Pause right there and let's go into a, a world maybe based on Kubernetes where we can get a little bit more dynamic, where we can apply some type of uh, security or firewall rules in an environment like this. So the, uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to our, our trusty since a lot of typing that I am going to need to do. Um, we're going to we're going to take a look at a, a, a script that is running. This is a live demo. And we're in, first of all, we're just installing a couple of applications, a hello world application and a sleep application. If you come here, we look at our cluster, we can see now that uh, these were installed. Hello, hello world, V1 and V2 and, and sleep. And from the bottom pane here, we are going to make a call from the sleep service to the hello world service. All right, so now if we call it a couple of times, we can see the traffic is, is going through. If I come into, uh, come here and go to deployment in, in, in default, we'll take a look at maybe uh, the, the hello world deployment v1. We'll scale that to, to two, uh, maybe three replicas. I will give that a second. We can see in this dynamic environment where we can quickly scale up applications. Let's just go to, so here we can see we have a bunch of Hello World uh, services now running. In this world, we can we can still call these services. We get load balancing, or at least some simplified load balancing. Things continue to work. It was the, an environment like Kubernetes was built for this dynamicism. All right now, if I create a new application, maybe put it in a different name, a Kubernetes namespace. Uh, a new client in, in this case, in, in this demo. So now we have a sleep two namespace. And from this new client, we come over here, find our namespaces. We see sleep two, there's our new client. We see a new sleep application running here. All right, now if I try to call this, and you can see on the bottom screen, we're calling sleep in our new sleep two client call call hello world a couple of times we we get traffic going through 
right? So we can add clients, we can scale up, we can scale down, but now we need to kind of control and define usage policies or, or access or security policies about what services really are allowed to communicate with which, which other services. And we're gonna do that in Kubernetes using a network policy. Now this might not be all that new to some of you that are veteran in this area, but the Kubernetes uh, 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 networking and how it's implemented um, and how its service abstraction is, is implemented and, and what we just saw uh, can be implemented with, with the cube proxy using IP tables, which I, I dumped here. We can, uh, we can take a look at um, uh, you know, what, uh, what, what some of those rules might look like a little complicated, but we also, we also can leverage various plugins to do network policy. So let's take a look at what a network policy might look like. So it's the declarative configuration. This is important because we don't want to have various scripts that say, Hey, uh, if this pod IP is this and this pod IP is this, then it's okay because these pod IPs are cycling and changing all the time. We want to declare, hey, for apps that look like this, they can talk to apps that look like this. Their pod IPs uh, could be changing. So in this case, we're saying for the Hello World service, we will allow traffic only from workloads or clients that have that live in a namespace that have been labeled a certain way. In this case, project is, is some, some value, LF demo in this case, All right? So we can only call hello world service if we're a client that lives in this, this, uh, this namespace. So let's label the default namespace correctly so that the sleep service Okay, get pod in default, the sleep service can call the hello world service in this namespace. But from the sleep to namespace, right from here, our client over here, we should not be able to call the hello world service anymore. All right, so let's try to call it from namespace two. we see here. If we try to call it, the call doesn't succeed. The, the networking rule or the policy that we set in place here does not allow that. Max time, we'll just give it three seconds, right? So if we try to call it, it won't, it'll wait after three seconds, it'll say, can't connect. Now, if we scaled up the clients and so on in, in, uh, in sleep two, it, it won't matter. It doesn't matter which pod, right? It's, it's starting to look at certain attributes and dynamically be aware of how to apply that uh, that policy. All right, let's take that. Let's clean up a little bit before we get to the next next section here. Oh, not share. All right. So we have a dynamic environment. We have some some ways to set up uh, policy, but we might need to go a little bit deeper than that. And so that's where. You know these plugins or these uh, the, a CNI um, can come in and provide a lot of power. So Kubernetes has been built very pluggable. Uh, so for things like networking and how Kubernetes does networking, it, it has some assumptions, but it doesn't force you to do um, uh, to, to implement those assumptions a certain way. So we can plug in and plug out. The various, uh, the various networking mechanisms that we might want to use for our, our uh, workloads. And so a particularly interesting CNI or container networking solution is Cilium. Now Cilium has been built from, from the core to um, implement networking using a technology called eBPF. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But what, what it does is it digs into the Linux kernel and has very deep control over how a packet gets routed into the system between the containers. And uh, you know, it, it determines the best paths and optimizes uh, uh, for certain scenarios. 
and allows us to implement networking policy at a layer in, in the kernel uh, and be very programmatic about how, how we do that. So Cilium brings in things like security controls uh, and advanced networking policy that, uh, that, that is implemented ultimately in the kernel with the eBPF. Now, with this uh, foundation, we can do things like um, scalable service load balancing. What I mean by that is you saw the IP tables that I dumped earlier in, uh, in, in the Kubernetes cluster. When you get to a certain size, certain um, uh, number of nodes and number of pods, number of services in Kubernetes, you know, IP tables is, uh, you know, is, is powerful, it's awesome, um, but at a certain scale starts to slow down and degrade because IP tables rules and, and, and the chains are evaluated sequentially and, uh, and in order. And the more services you add and the more uh, nodes and uh, more workloads you have, the longer those chains get. All right, so we can do fairly sophisticated uh, service load balancing using eBPF to kind of, kind of we, we end up not using IP tables and net filter anymore. We go directly into the kernel, we capture packets at certain points and, uh, and we start building up the, the, uh, the service load balancing capability inside the kernel itself. Um, and so therefore we can scale to larger clusters. We can scale to uh, a lot of workloads, dynamic and constantly shifting and constantly changing workloads. We can implement sophisticated uh, network policy. We'll take a look at that in a second. And with eBPF, we can, we can capture what's happening in the network at, at, at the source, uh, you know, where, where it's happening in, in the kernel. And we can build um, you know, various uh, dashboards and telemetry collection systems and, um, and, uh, and, and so on. So Cilium is a, a fairly powerful networking overlay or, uh, or CNI in the Kubernetes world that, uh, like I mentioned, is built on eBPF. Now, eBPF is, is not all that new, but recently, um, you know, has made some advancements in, in, in the kernel uh, to support it. And what it is, is a, a programmable engine in the kernel that uh, allows you to hook into certain event points so, for example, in, in terms of networking, if a, if a packet shows up on a network inter interface, can we intercept that, take a look at it, and make decisions based on that? So, can we write our own programs that are safe to run in this VM in the kernel? And, you know, the kernel does validation and so on before it's able to run it. And, um, and then basically inject, so in this next slide, it's, it's sort of a, uh, event-driven programming model for the various events. And there's, there's you know, the, the Linux kernel is built in all these hook points uh, throughout uh, the kernel. But specifically in terms of networking, can we evaluate these and make decisions about, uh, about the packets and, and be extremely performant and, uh, and efficient about uh, uh, the sort of routing and uh, manipulations that we might need to do without having to use uh, things like NetFilter and, uh, and, and IP tables. So Cilium, is an implement, or Cilium implements a lot of those capabilities in eBPF. Let's take a look at, uh, at, at Cilium real quick. So we can see here in our Kubernetes cluster, we do have Cilium installed. We only have one node on this cluster, so you only see one, one agent, but but the Cilium agent would run per, uh, per node. And this agent, you can see it's in the cube system namespace, um, has the permissions to manipulate eBPF uh, maps, which are data structures that can be shared between eBPF code and the user space, uh, as well as installing the eBPF programs uh, themselves. So the first thing let's check is what does, EB, what does Cilium know about our system? Let's take a look at the at at, at our status here. Um, we can see that uh, you know we don't we don't fully and that's why you saw earlier the uh, IP tables that we don't fully replace cube proxy but we can replace completely replace cube proxy. 
right? So all of the service redirection and how you load balance, all, all that stuff can be replaced with, uh, with, with Cilium. We can also see that uh, there are a handful of uh, maps for uh, implementing the service load balancing, for implementing things like uh, uh, networking policy. Uh, and, and, and so you can see the, the, the maps here. And we can see that the uh, cluster health, all the nodes and so on, and so on the agents are, uh, are up and running correctly. So next let's take a look at our eBPF load balancing list. So you can see here in, in Kubernetes, we do have a, um, in, you know, we, we have our Kubernetes services, but Cilium has identified these and like I said, instead of leveraging IP tables or even IPVS, what we've done is we've built a map of the services um, in our cluster and, and, and leveraged the uh, eBPF to um, capture the endpoints and, um, and provide the actual routing that, that happens there. All right, so now when we make calls from the sleep service to hello world, those packets are getting uh, captured in, in, these, in the eBPF um, uh, hook, these hook points that are, that are in the kernel. And it's the eBPF programs that are saying, oh, you're trying to talk to uh, the hello world service. Well, I know about these backends. I know how to do the, the DNAT and the SNAT and actually route the traffic correctly uh, without hitting any of the uh, any of the other uh, parts of the Linux, uh, you know, uh, IP, IP, IP tables and, and those uh, net filter um, components. So if we if we also take a look at what, what Cilium knows about the system, Cilium knows about the various endpoints that we, we might have running in uh, in our cluster, and it also knows about um, something we call identity or how to identify what services represent or what uh, what endpoints represent a specific service. So if we take a look at a at the sleep endpoint. Take a look at the at, at the sleep endpoint, and uh, and take a look at its uh, um, output here. We see that these labels are what can be used to identify the workloads that belong to the sleep service. And now, if I get the, the identities from the system, we can see what are the numeric uh, identities that make up. Hey, this is the sleep service. And any of the pods that might be scaling, out of scaling, um, you know, those all are part of the sleep service and they get identified by a particular number that internally then gets used uh, to implement things like networking policy. So if I get the Cilium identity for, um, for the sleep service, we can see we have our our, our, our num the number and we have the labels uh, that, uh, that make up the grouping of pods or IPs that, uh, that make up the sleep service. Now let's take a look at how we might specify policy using Cilium. Now Cilium is a superset of uh, functionality on top of Kubernetes network policy that uses these endpoints and identities under the covers to, to map and to implement our, our network policy. Now, Cilium does also implement the Kubernetes network policy. So if you just wanna to stick to the plain Jane, you know, the, the lowest common denominator type functionality, then, uh, then Cilium, does, Cilium does implement that. But for more expressive uh, capabilities, um, you know, the Cilium network policy custom resource in Kubernetes allows you to be more expressive uh, specify things by DNS uh, and be a little bit more fine grained than what the what the Kubernetes um, network policy allows. So in this case, we will uh, apply a Cilium network policy. And now, if we try to call it from sleep, we should see that it continues to work. But if we call it from sleep too, that we see 
that same behavior. That, that Cilium is in the data path and is evaluating what IPs are calling, what identities are calling, what other identities, um, and you know, blocking traffic that uh, that shouldn't that shouldn't be going through. Now, Cilium can also do a uh, a bit of layer seven handling and networking policy around uh, layer seven. So if we take a look at this networking policy, we can see that uh, we can specify HTTP type rules as well. So what services can call which other services, but even to the level of what path on an HTTP uh, call can we can, can is allowed between those services. So if we apply this, What we what we notice is we we just we just added a few more policies to our uh, network policy here. I can still call things, right? Because uh, the hello world or the hello and and the uh, uh, path is what we're, is part of what we're calling here. But you'll notice under the covers that Cilium spun up a a, a separate. Um, a separate component. Oops. Oh, no, no, delete. <laughs> no. Uh, here, one second. We, one second, I ruined. Uh, the automation was supposed to help me here, but it did not help me at all. Um, so we're going to apply resources, I think, L7. All right, we'll put that back. Um, we will then log into our Cilium agent. And what we're going to take a look at here is that the Cilium agent, since it saw an L7 policy, it actually spun up an Envoy proxy. And so at the layer three and layer four parts of the network, Cilium will, will try to use eBPF and optimize away the, the, the network routing. But when it comes to layer seven, the traffic is routed through Envoy and Envoy is applying these uh, or helping to enforce these policies um, that are spe specified at layer seven. And you can see that the Cilium agent runs per node and um, per, uh, per, per host basically and is shared for all the workloads on that, uh, on that node. So let's, Come back to the presentation. Now, one of the one of the things that uh, becomes very interesting. So we were able to see that uh, in a dynamic environment with Kubernetes, you know, we have some mechanisms for enforcing um, network level connectivity and and policy. We can use things like, like Cilium to get a much deeper and richer look at uh, uh, the telemetry collection, uh, the routing enforcement, the um, you know, even the implementation of cube service itself in, in the cluster to improve performance and, uh, and, and to give a, a certain level of uh, observability. But when we think about applications communicating with each other, and APIs and uh, various policies enforcement that we want to make at the grant granularity of a of an actual application or uh, actual workload. Um, this is where things like the service mesh starts to come into the picture. So what, what the service mesh does is it actually pr um, puts these enforcement points, these policy enforcement points next to the application. So they almost become one with the application. And they do this in the way of, of adding these sidecar proxies, right? Now these sidecar proxies intercept the traffic, whether they're outbound from a particular service, in this case, service A, or they're inbound to a particular service, service B in this case, and they apply various layer seven or higher layer application layer, uh, constructs like retries and circuit breaking and, um, you know, request, um, uh, you know, uh, canarying and, and, and traffic splitting and, and these types of things. Now, the, the service mesh 
like I said, does this at the application layer? Does it add, you know, these proxies are deployed per service instance. So it doesn't matter what the underlying network looks like and where it might be running. So we get the policy enforcement happening at the highest layers and at the finest grain scope with, uh, with, with each of the applications. And so that's where something like Istio comes into the picture. So you have Kubernetes and you have the, the CNI like, like Cilium uh, provide rich container networking uh, network policy. But now we can even get to the level of the uh, uh, application instance. We can collect telemetry about each application instance. We can um, provide a cryptographic identity to, that represents the application, not just its IPs. And we can do this at the level of granularity of an application instance, not just the, the, the node that it runs on. All right, so let me just do a quick, uh, quick demo to, to show that out. We're going to install Istio. You can see here, uh, actually, if we go to, let's just go to all the, all the pods. You can see Istio is starting to install. We're adding uh, a few more services here. And the next thing we want to do is, so Istio is installed. The next thing that we want to do is uh, we, we see that the, the applications that are running in our default namespace, they don't have the Istio sidecar installed. I mentioned the proxy um, you know, per workload or proxy per instance is not, is not there right now. So we do need to uh, enable that. We'll do that by labeling the default namespace, and then we'll uh, restart the the pods. So there's some amount of uh, you know, but it, it, it is something that you have to plan for. It's not something that you can just uh, trans all you know transparently without having taking some action install. Um, and so we do need to get those uh, those sidecar proxies. If we take a look at them slowly coming up. You can see that the old ones are, are going away. The new pods are coming up and they have more than one container. They have two containers here, one that represents the workload and one container that represents the, uh, the sidecar or the, uh, the proxy service proxy that runs with the, the instance. Okay, so now we can see that our workloads do have the sidecar running and from here we can do things like enabling mutual tls so that connections between the services in the mesh um you know they they use a mutual tls connection and a cryptographic identity to uh to specify that mutual tls now let's take a look at that cryptographic identity oh uh is that right yeah it looks right so basically what we're going to do is we're going to go into the mesh into our sleep application again. And we're gonna use some tooling to connect up to a client. And we wanna see the, cert the certification or the certificates that are uh, now pre being presented uh, by, by the service. This Hello World service is now presenting a certificate saying, hey, I'm Hello World, you tell me who you are. All right, but, it, but it's actually the service mesh proxy that's doing this. So if we run this, uh, cross fingers shows up. Oh, did not show up. Uh, why not? Uh, one second. Get to see me debug it live. This was just working. All right. Uh, that looks correct. We're not seeing the certificates. Let me see. Why not? I do not know why not. That is odd about my 
I don't know. So what, what I was expecting to see is that uh, when we call in and request and, and, and show that uh, mutual TLS is indeed enabled, that we would uh, we would see the certificates and we would be able to prove out the uh, the cryptographic uh, identity that specifies, hey, this is the Hello World service or this is the uh, the the sleep service, but we are not getting that. Uh, and we might have to just move on, but let's take a look at this. Why, why is this? So mo TLS mode is strict. We put this into the default namespace. It's in default. Let's let's add this to uh, um, Vistio system. See what happens. Uh, one second. I specified it as default. What happens if we do this? Still no. All right. Well, I'm not sure. This was just working. <laughs> I must have a, an issue with my uh, configuration here somewhere. But um, so we won't be able to. But you know, if we had this, uh, actually, let's, let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. Um, and then in Istio, if we have that cryptographic identity, um, we can specify what traffic is allowed and not allowed based on the cryptographic identity, what's happening on the connection itself, not just from where it originated. So if we, if we have this, uh, this authorization policy and we say that uh, hello world, where's the selector right here, the hello world, uh, service can only get traffic from the cryptographic identity represented by the sleep service and not just sleep, but sleep in the default namespace. And these paths, these uh, ports are, uh, are available or, or can, be, can be used. So if we apply this, now down below, we can see that we uh cannot call it something's going really going on with my uh with my environment here I apologize i don't and i don't know why but let's uh the yaml file specified default yeah um but we should have And you get here authentication. Uh, and we have it in both. Let's delete the one in, in default. Still no. Let's do one more thing, and then we're just we're just gonna have to move on. But logs, I'm not seeing any issues here. And not seeing any issues here. Uh, give that a second to complete. All right, let's try to do that. No, I don't know. All right, well, I guess I, I really screwed something up in uh, in setting up this uh, this cluster here. Um, all right, well, we will we'll continue here. So, right, okay. So now, what we what we would have what we did we did see that um, you know we have networking in layers, we have security in layers, we have the CNI 
you know, things like Cilium that can provide some amount of layer seven capability, but not, not the full uh, amount that we need from, uh, from, from something like a service mesh. And we, but we see that the service mesh, it uses proxies that get deployed with each workload instance to implement this, uh, this layer seven capability. So is there, so we, we, we can go from one proxy on a node or a proxy on every single workload instance, All right? So now what is a, a reasonable approach to, to doing this, especially when you're lo looking at it from the perspective of, I just want to apply policy. I don't care if there's a service mesh or CNI, or I don't care about any of that, All right? I just, I want to consistently apply uh, my shared policies about APIs communicating with each other, end users communicating with the APIs, and and, and so on. All right. So then the question just becomes about well, how how do we implement the data plane to support that? How do we tie things in at the CNI if we if we need to? Where does EPPF start to come into the picture, and what are some of the trade offs that we're willing to make when we implement this data plane? All right. So some of the things we're probably very interested in are uh, resource overhead and usage, All right? So if you're thinking of a one proxy per node or a you know, many thousand proxy per node uh, deployment, you're you know, potentially gonna be thinking about, well, what are, what are the, the trade-offs I can make for resource overhead? Another is you know, the opposite side of the, of the spectrum. Right, where you try to share everything in a single proxy, you start to run into issues, noisy neighbor type issues, uh, especially in areas where we know, working with our, our, our users, that extensibility, customization, these, these are really important to the data plane in environments like this. Um, you know, we, 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 we see that the service mesh itself, even that has the granularity of a workload instance, we see things like it gets 80, 85% of the way there. But in these environments where applications are already running, uh, you know, these wonky enterprise environments or maybe some backward compatibility um, uh, needs and so on, but that last 15% needs to be implemented somehow. And those are very specific and custom to a particular application. And so how you, how you trade off between resource overhead and extensibility feature usage, feature isolation and so on, becomes a very important uh, topic. How you specify your, your security boundaries or how you're identifying particular workloads. And what happens if one of those, um, those, those proxies that are serving layer seven becomes compromised. And then the last is uh, not least by any stretch that um, how you actually introduce the service mesh how, or, or these capabilities, how you upgrade and maintain and patch these capabilities in, in the data plane, these are all very important. So if we, if we look at those different dimensions and how we might implement a data plane to, uh, to account for those things, we see things like the sidecar deployment, which we have in uh, just about every service mesh deployment out there, where we deploy a proxy per workload instance. And you know, we, we have um, you know, good feature isolation, but we have uh, not so good resource overhead, All right? And, and so in terms of those dimensions and um, you know, how they, how, how we trade things off. So we tra we're trading off resource overhead for, um, you know, feature isolation, extensibility, tenancy, um, and a very fine grain security. So like I, I, I tried to show you there with, uh, with Istio that uh, we can get workload identification down to the actual pod. Uh, now, operationally, uh, upgrading this, maintaining this, having to, you know, inject sidecars, restart workload, all this. So this is actually, maybe I should move that, that little bullet over to, uh, to the left a little bit more. That's not, that's not very ideal. Now the alternative 
at the other extreme is we'll just share this in one big proxy on the node. And all of the traffic will flow through these proxies. We'll implement service mesh like behavior or these, these enforcement policies down at, at this layer. Um, and we'll get much better resource utilization because now we have only one, although it's a much bigger proxy, it's still only one uh, versus the many thousands per, per node you might see with a sidecar. Um, but then you run into the tenancy problems, All right? There's no, there's, you know, the feature isolation, the um, extensibility becomes much more, uh, you know, disruptive. You get, and, and we see this all the time when we try to uh, stand up shared gateways that, uh, that, that try to do everything for all of, all of its services, all of its clients. Um, and so security granularity, um, feature isolation, these are all things that we trade off when we try to use a single node per, per node per, per host or single proxy per node. Now, these are not the only, these, are, these might be the two ex most extreme usages, but these are not the only approaches. Uh, we can try to find some balance in, in between and, uh, and maybe use proxies per identity so that we're not trying to share identity and try to share uh, extensions and custom configurations for all of the applications on a particular host. And this, this model you know, does give us a little bit better resource overhead. It gives us feature isolation. And you know, from a upgrade standpoint, we can upgrade these things independently of the applications. And, uh, and you know, it, it, still, it still provides a level of security granularity that we need um, when services are communicating with each other. Now, there's also an approach that uh, uh, allows you to remove the proxies completely from the, uh, the end nodes that allow you to implement these capabilities out, outside somewhere else in a, some pool of proxies uh, that align with the identity, align with the service account. Um, and in, in this model, we, oops, oh, I didn't put the, the last slide there. So in, in this model, operationally, we get uh, a much better separation. Um, we get better resource overhead and resource usage. Uh, we, we might take some penalties in, in performance, although your environment may, uh, may uh, be able to account for this. Um, but we also maintain our, um, our extensibility, our tenancy, uh, and our, our security granularity down to the level of a particular identity. All right, so there are various models for how we can implement a, a uh, a layer or, or a policy enforcement a layer that um, you know trades off the best of both worlds here, and um, yeah, that's uh, it, it's not one or or the other. Now, the last thing, and I don't have time now. Uh, I had I actually had a separate cluster for this demo. Um, is around getting around. You know, th these policies could potentially conflict with each other. And what we typically see people do, and this is what we did at Solo, is we built an abstraction layer that focuses primarily on what are the policies that you care about, not how they get implemented. What are the workflows that you need, the tenancy constructs that you might need for your teams? So how do you actually operationalize this and, and um, enable this among your teams? And then let the underlying data plane pieces, however they are implemented, um, you know, the, the configurations specifically that drive them will automate all that stuff. All right, and so that's that's typically the path that someone and certain people we've seen go down where you're trying to kind of keep consistency because you don't want the, you know, the Istio policies to say, yeah, you can do this. And the networking policies say, no, you can't do that. And, and find out at runtime that, hey, the, the, 
you know, why, why are we enabling it on the Istio side then, right? Why don't we just get consistency across all of the uh, the networking policies? And, and and that's why it's important to treat it just as, hey, this is, these are these are just policies. I don't care how they get implemented. So, you know, just to, to recap, we, we looked at the, um, you know, the, the world and the way we've been deploying applications has changed. Uh, we need to be more dynamic in the way that we deal with uh, networking in general, application policies in general, and we do have good open source solutions for that. There are various trade-offs that you will need to that you, you should be thinking through when you're considering one or the other or both, um, and focus on those higher level policies. It doesn't matter if there's where the proxies are, who, what, how many there are on that stuff to the end user, maybe to the platform owner and to the person paying the bills, but the end user cares about the, the policies are implemented and they're implemented consistently and correctly across their application uh, workloads. Um, again, like I said at the beginning, this is, this is an area at uh, solo.io that we've uh, been very interested in. We built our products around, we built a lot of educational material around please go check out, you know, we do workshops and offer certifications, uh, all free, by the way, this is not, we're, we're more interested in educating the market than we are making money on training. Um, so all of this stuff is, uh, is free. Uh, so, so please go check it out. And I mentioned the, the products that we're working on uh, around, you know, the you know, connecting the services, securing services, regardless of what the data plane looks like. If you're interested in working on things like Cilium, like Envoy, like Istio, like GraphQL, and, and the operating components around it, how you actually do this in an enterprise, then uh, please come talk to us. We're, uh, we're uh, hiring and we, um, you know, we have a lot, to, uh, a lot of opportunity to work on. So uh, be a good, good place if you're interested in those, uh, in those technologies. So I know I'm running up here against the clock. I do want to say thank you all for joining live, the ones that did, um, and uh, and definitely feel free to reach out for those that are, are watching on, on a recording at some point. Always happy to uh, answer questions. Uh, so let's take a look as we do have some, uh, I see, and please use the Q&A if, um, if you would like to answer a question. Some of these are comments about uh, the demo. So the question was, is traffic encrypted between the sidecar and the pod as well? And so I, this is in the, the sidecar approach. When you inject the sidecar into the application, that, uh, that communication between the, the app and the sidecar, you know, there's a link there, all, the, all of the, the IP tables or uh, CNI is used to redirect traffic. So when an app is trying to talk outside of the pod, talk to a different application, all that traffic first goes through the proxy. And then the proxy then, you know, decides how it's going to route the traffic, how it will do load balancing, and it will create a mutual TLS connection to those upstream call callers or upstream clients. Now, the, so from the proxy to the other side, that is encrypted, as encrypted with mutual TLS. The part that's in the pod between the app and the, the proxy is not encrypted. Now those live on the same node, same host, and those actually both uh, um, exist in the same network namespace as well. So from outside, from the node, you know, um, you know that that traffic is is uh, kind of shielded. So, but to answer the question, that, that, that link, that part is not, um, is not encrypted. Uh, some, some, another uh, asks, why should we implement end user authentication using Istio? What are the benefits? So end user authentication, I assume you mean the, um, that, the, the, the person, the end user that initiated the API calls that then might cause services to communicate with each other. 
right? Because because there's authentication, the services themselves, service A talks to service B, but service A might be calling service B on behalf of, you know, user, whatever, some, some user. And so I think if your question is asking, why should we implement end user authentication using Istio, what are, what are the benefits? So like, like I was just alluding to, those calls, those service calls, service A doesn't talk to service B usually because service A has a life of its own. It's interested in talking to service B, right? Some, something initiated that uh, those, those calls. So when you're thinking about whether a request from you know, service A to service B should continue. It's not just based on the identities of the services. And it's not just based on maybe the location of the services um, or what boundary they exist. And it, you probably want to take into account, um, you know, things like who, who initiated this call? Why is this user calling uh, or, or attempting to call a, another particular service? And so from that perspective, Istio or the service mesh is on the data path, it can see, it can see, you know, different uh, credential material that represent the end user. A lot of times the application needs to know this, um, but if we can get some level of authentication and authorization, you know, in, in, in the network, then we can offload some of the things that the application has to do and make it easier to, uh, reason about and, and write the applications as well. So Istio or the service mesh in general, this application networking layer, having awareness of an end user is also extremely uh, useful and valuable to give accurate uh, security policy enforcement. Uh, somebody asked if we'll be sharing the demo and, uh, and slides. Absolutely. Uh, we might actually want to, I might go back and try to figure out what happened on the, on the Istio demo. Uh, that stuff is usually pretty rock solid, but I must have misconfigured something on the demo. But yes, we will publish the demo and, uh, and the slides. So I appreciate, again, your attendance. Thank you, Linux Foundation. Um, thank you, Solo, for uh, sponsoring and, uh, and organizing. And um, yeah, reach out, like I said, if you, uh, if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Christian, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you will join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day.